Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Mark Lessing, the CFO of Insight Venture Partners, and with me is Stuart Mayer, who many of you know. He's the principal of finance at Insight. Insight currently is well over 125 portfolio companies, and since our inception has invested in over 300 software and internet companies. Historically, we have held CFO conferences for our portfolio companies, and we're now planning to offer a series of CFO webinar, webinars on topics that we think are applicable to our portfolio companies. I encourage you to email me and Stuart with suggestions for future topics for webinars or CFO conferences. Today, KPMG has offered to host this webinar to make sure our portfolio companies are aware of the risks associated with state sales and use tax in the United States. Darren McCarthy is a principal in KPMG's state and local tax practice and has nearly 20 years of extensive experience in this area. Darren previously worked as a tax attorney at the Massachusetts Department of Revenue. Sometimes these tax issues have caused problems for our portfolio companies, so I hope you find this webinar useful. Darren, I will now hand over the presentation to you. Okay, thank you, Mark. I'm just waiting for the controls to show up. So, so actually, this, this is uh, Russ Penelis, and uh, I'm a, an M&A tax principal at KPMG and been working with uh, the inside folks and Mark uh, for a long time, probably 10 or 15 years. And uh, I had uh, suggested that we do this presentation uh, based on some experience that we've had with some of our clients, uh, both, uh, both when we're diligencing a company and with some experience that we had uh, when, when, looking, when a client was looking to sell a company. You know, we recently had uh, just, just really a nightmare experience for a client where uh, they were looking to sell a portfolio company. They had a very successful transaction. They had a very successful deal. Uh, they were looking to sell to a large Fortune 500 company. And lo and behold, they figured out they, during the diligence process, the, uh, the buyer figured out that the, that the target should have been withholding sales tax uh, essentially for years and they hadn't been. Um, and then we started to talk about, well, what's the potential liability here? And, and it turned out to be numbers that were just enormous. And the reason why the numbers are enormous in the case of sales tax, this goes to, you know, I'm, I'm historically I'm you know, a tax lawyer and I've really focused on, on federal income tax and I've always looked at sales and use tax and said, oh, you know, these are small numbers, they don't matter. But the problem is they're not small numbers because they're off of gross revenues. And so in this case, the, the, the top side risk was 10% of the enterprise value, uh, which was just a potential disaster that led to uh, the deal collapsing, um, us going in and helping the company get their ducks in a row in terms of their sales and use tax. In fact, their liability was much, much lower than that 10% of enterprise value. In fact, it was, it was, it was lower than 1%, uh, but because they hadn't thought through these things and didn't have their ducks in a row, when the diligence process happened, they, they just didn't have answers to the, uh, to the potential buyer's questions. And so uh, even when we looked at it initially, it looked like the, the potential top side risk was enormous. Uh, and it took a good bit of work to figure out that the real risk was much smaller. Um, in terms of uh, uh, Insights portfolio companies, this is an area where uh, the law has been moving around and companies and, and, and states have been really expanding the application of sales and use tax and, and who owes it and when. And so it's something that, that I had discussed with Mark was, was important for, for all of you folks to know and understand and, and have a handle over what the current state of play is in sales and use tax world. So, uh, so Darren's really our, our go-to guy on this. Uh, so I asked him to, to come in and, and do this presentation. I hope it's helpful to everyone. All right, <clears throat> thank you very much, Russ. Um, I guess with that, we'll, we'll move into the slides. Um, well, if you, Mark, kind enough to provide a brief introduction of myself, so I'll, I'll just skip that point for now. Uh, with respect to the agenda, uh, we're going to look at, you know, why is sales and use tax important? Uh, and really the answers are, you know, don't let a customer liability become your liability, right? And if you are non-compliant with your sales and use tax collection uh, and remittance obligations, you end up incurring more than just the tax liability, but fairly significant penalties and interest for noncompliance. So that's why it's important to kind of be on top of this 
um, and don't let something that uh, could be very controllable become uncontrollable. And that the second sort of part of the agenda will be how do I identify my sales and use tax compliance obligations? And really it's just a two-step analysis. Um, first, you have to determine whether or not what you do creates nexus. Do you meet the definition of doing business in the state and therefore trigger the obligation to collect or miss sales tax? If you don't have nexus, it really doesn't matter if it's taxable or not. But if you do have nexus, then you have to move to step two and determine the taxability of your revenue streams. And we'll get into some of that. But uh, th there's a two-step process that needs to take place. So the overarching objectives uh, that we have here today is make sure that you're aware of your obligations, right? Nexus itself is not simple. And we're gonna walk through some complexities around you know, why it's important to understand Nexus and, and really why it's important to have somebody come in and, advise, and really advise you on what your, what your particular business does and how it would create nexus and create those obligations. Every company's nexus profile is unique to that business. Uh, it, it really depends upon how you conduct your operations and what your activities are in and among the jurisdictions in the state. You want to avoid these unnecessary exposures, uh, like, I, like I just mentioned the objective in the agenda, right? Let the, let, let the consumer, your customer, bear the burden of this cost. I mean, that's essentially what it is. It's a consumer-based tax. It's just that you as a vendor have the obligation to collect that tax from the consumer. So, you know, look, look, get your advice now and implement best practices now so that you avoid the, you know, the relatively expensive alternative to dealing with, you know, assessments from states and hiring people to try to, you know, navigate the appeal process. You might want to consider different types of exposure mitigation strategies, which we can touch on briefly at the end, uh, that might be right for your business. And then as, as Russ discussed, you know, our intention here is to make sure that you are able eventually to navigate that sort of due dil tax due diligence process. Um, you know, you're going to encounter a guy like me um, who is going to be on the other end of the phone asking some questions about your business and really just taking the information that you provide verbally and trying to deduce whether or not you have obligations to collect or mid sales tax in different states. If you don't go into that process prepared, uh, and by prepared, I mean prepared with some sort of, you know, having done some upfront work to get comfortable with your nexus and your taxability. Um, you know, a buy side advisor, you know, doesn't really have the time or the ability to do all of that upfront, you know, during the diligence process. And they're just going to take some worst case scenario approach. So I've been doing this, like Mark alluded to, almost 20 years. Um, I've been doing on, you know, working in the transactional world for at least 15 of those. You know, and prior to that, I did have some experience working with the government. So I'm well aware of sort of, you know, what the government is looking at and, you know, really how we go about uh, assisting and working with companies navigating the buy side and sell side process. <clears throat> uh, we'll move along through the slides here. I'm assuming everybody can see uh, what, I'm, you know, what I see. Why is, is sales news tax compliance important? I put this pie chart together just to show you and to give you an appreciation for sales and use tax generally and what it means to the states. And you can see that more than 30% of total revenue generated by the states comes through the sales and use tax, um, uh, the application of sales and use tax to, to products and services sold in the marketplace. Corporate income tax is a very small component to the state revenue. And of course, personal income tax is, is a very large component. But sales and use tax is a really, it's a key area for states to focus in on. And with the, you know, with the advent of you know, sales uh, through uh, the internet and, you know, sales that are related to hosted software and, and the way we conduct business nowadays, many states are losing out on a great deal of revenue uh, and, they're, and they're looking for ways to aggressively find companies and identify those companies that should have been, you know, compliant as it relates to their sales and use tax uh, collection or business obligations. So just be aware that it's a, it's a major source of revenue for states. The next slide sort of depicts what that, you know, what Russ was alluding to in sort of that worst case scenario uh, situation where, you know, again, you get a, you get a buy side advisor come into a, a into the diligence process, you know, and, and it's not, it's not un, uh, uncommon for, you know, the tax folks to come in sort of later in the process. And we are do the best we can to try to evaluate what the potential risk could be at a company. Um, and if any of you have ever, ever been on the other side of the phone, you know, you, it may start out with sort of just, Let's just talk about your business operations. How do you conduct your, your, you know, your sales activities? Do you send people out into the marketplace? Are people traveling? You know, how else do you facilitate sales, you know, among your customer base? And 
you know, in that conversation, I'm trying to find areas where, you know, is what you do and how you facilitate and generate your, your sales activities, does that create nexus for you? And does that create obligations to collect from its sales tax depending on what you sell? Uh, I'm not conducting a nexus study. A nexus study is a very involved process that should be conducted and considered very regularly. Uh, but that is, you know, that's not what I'm doing during the diligence process. I'm trying to assess risk as it relates to your business. And I don't have all of the information that, that, that you would have in order to, you know, properly assess does my activity in a particular jurisdiction require me to collect a rent sales tax. So based upon that conversation, I may come out of that with, well, you know, what they described leads me to believe you have nexus everywhere. And then based upon your sales activities into those jurisdictions, to the extent you are non-compliant, that is, haven't filed tax returns there, you may find yourself in a situation where, you know, just simply having $5 million of sales into, into 10 states over the course of eight years, you find yourself with a $50 million tax exposure uh, when you look at the tax liability and then the applicable penalties and interest and how it compounds. So it, it, it tend, it's a very serious matter, and it's something that really should be addressed uh, especially in the context of a, you know, being a compliant taxpayer, and then of course, you know, trying to um, not let something like this become a deal issue in the context of uh, any kind of due diligence process. Okay. So how do I identify my obligations? I, I first look at nexus. You know, in order for a state to impose tax on a company, the company must first have sufficient contact to create nexus with the state. And what does that mean? You know, typically it means some form of physical presence, right? Either you have property or uh, you lease or own property in a state, or you're employing a person in a state, or you engage with an agent to act on your behalf in a state. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be a permanent presence, right? Oftentimes people think, well, I just look at my apportionment data and wherever I have property and payroll, that's where I have nexus. That's not necessarily the case. You have to evaluate where you travel and the nature of your travel activities and what you're doing in those jurisdictions to determine whether or not but to evaluate whether or not that creates an obligation to actually comply with your tax uh, obligations. Um, the concept of nexus is a constitutional concept, right? We're talking about, you know, do you pass uh, the minimal connection requirements as uh, necessary under the due process clause of the United States Constitution? Um, when we think about, you know, is, it, is, is, is that minimal connection met? Yes, but then do you meet the substantial nexus requirement as what's required under the Commerce Clause. So the Commerce Clause, right, is something that, you know, in order for, in order to regulate interstate commerce, Congress essentially is, in that, is empowered with the, with the uh, ability, the requirement to regulate interstate commerce. Excuse me. Uh, and, you know, we're gonna see that Congress has acted in some capacities and then not acted in others. And where the Congress hasn't acted, the courts have stepped in in some capacities to act on their behalf. The first time Congress, or really the first and only time Congress stepped in was in, back in 1959. Uh, they enacted a congressional law commonly referred to as Public Law 86272. Some of you may have heard that term before. What's very important to understand is Public Law 86272 only applies to income taxes, right? Income taxes only. That is, if what you do in a state is, is limited or um, is only um, the solicitation of sales of tangible personal property in the state, where any orders for such property uh, and the approval of such orders occurs from a location outside the state, and the goods or tangible personal property is shipped from that location into the state, all these sort of hurdles you have to get over, um, your activities would be protected under this congressional law. However, this congressional law does not apply to sales taxes. So even if you have no obligation to file an income tax return in a jurisdiction, you may in fact have obligations to file and comply with your sales and use tax reporting requirements. I, the reason why I'm raising this is because I see one too many times companies believe or think that if all they do is enter into a state to solicit the sale of a product that they don't have to comply with tax reporting obligations and that's not actually true. You do have to still comply with your sales tax responsibility. All right, so, so Darren, so this, this comes up all the time for us when we're on the on the diligence side and we're looking at a company and they say, um, oh, you know, we don't have, we only have nexus in these five states because that's all we file income tax returns in. And so, so your point is that for sales tax, the definition of nexus is much broader than for income tax. 
And so if I just have some salesmen that go out and visit customers, or I have, uh, maybe they're not salesmen, maybe they're people that are going to help customers um, uh, with a system, right? So, so let's say I'm providing a, a software as a service and I send, my, I send my techs in to help you get your system up and running with my system. That, that may well create Nexus, right? That's correct. Absolutely. I, you know, that, that, actually, in fact, I would say that that does create Nexus, right? I mean, that's even what you described right there, Russ, is, is beyond the solicitation of sales, right? So you're talking about actually providing a service, and that clearly would create Nexus. So, yes, that's true. Um, there is a concept uh, known as de minimis activities, right, the de minimis exception. Um, this was sort of raised in, in, in some Supreme Court case law that talked about substantial Nexus and how that ties back to the Commerce Clause. Um, but it was left undefined by the courts, and it hasn't been addressed by Congress either. So the concept of de minimis activities in a jurisdiction is very specific to the company and very specific to the activities that are occurring. Uh, but I would say that you, know, you, you may make a very educated and, and, and uh, a practical decision around you know, whether your activities sort of qualify into this de minimis sort of uh, gray exception area. Uh, but my experience with the states are, you know, they're very, it's very limited circumstances in which they would apply any kind of de minimis threshold. So just, you just have to be very conscious that some people think, well, I've only gone into there, you know, twice or three times in any, in any particular year. You know, that doesn't rise to the level of nexus or, or, or substantial nexus. But the state may disagree with you on that point. So uh, there's very little published guidance out there about what qualifies for the de minimis exception because states like to leave that intentionally gray area open. Um, bringing the, the concept of nexus forward, Historically, and, I, and again, I encounter this all the time, where people think, "Well, I have, you know, my employees don't go into any jurisdictions. Um, rather, you know, they have agents, they have contractors acting on their behalf to facilitate sales." And there is Supreme Court precedence right on this point as well that dates back to 1960, 1987, where the Supreme Court said there's no constitutional, you know, uh, 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 distinction or significance between the use of contractors versus employees. If somebody's acting as your agent in a, in a jurisdiction, that in and of itself could create nexus. All right, so, so again, Darren, we, we were working on a transaction where somebody um, uh, installed equipment, right? They sold, they sold large equipment to, um, to retailers. It was, you know, like shelving space to retailers. And they said, oh, I don't have Nexus, right? I, I sit in my jurisdiction and I sell off the, the, these, these shelving space. But it turned out that they had agents that would install the shelving space in each, in each place. And so they would... Um, you know, the, 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 the buyer would, would buy the equipment and, and, and you know, the, our, our target was sitting in, say, Illinois. Um, but lo and behold, they would have to get it installed, so they would hire agents sort of in every state. And I think you came in and you said, well, that may create nexus in every state because you're selling into those states and you have this nexus through your agent that's going in and installing, even though you don't have a single employee in that state. That's exactly right. And, you know, and sometimes you have to look at that relationship between that contracted party and the company. Is it, you know, does the customer you know, believe or is there an interpretation of that relationship that is if, you know, the, the company that sold you the product, are they the ones that are doing the installation or are you engaging that third party, you know, directly as, as a consumer? So that relationship needs to be considered as to whether or not that would rise to the level of agency nexus, but that's exactly right. That's exactly on point with, on, with what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, bringing that agency <clears throat> concept forward to uh, what we call affiliate nexus. This is where you have multiple entities within a, you know, a consolidated group that may do, you know, operate in different capacities and have different functions. Uh, and there may be instances where one affiliate is acting or working on behalf of another. And that in-state presence of an affiliate may rise to the level of agency nexus and therefore create obligations for uh, out-of-state affiliate entities to actually have to file tax returns there. I put a couple of examples out here, one in Ohio where Saks Fifth Avenue, you know, uh, essentially the brick and mortar stores were in one entity and the catalog sales were in another entity and the brick and mortar stores would accept the returns of the catalog uh, re uh, you know, seller, the retailer, which was outside of uh, Ohio, didn't have its own physical presence in the state. And uh, the Supreme Court in Ohio said that that activity, the fact that they accepted returns and the fact that they distributed catalogs was not substantial nexus, did not rise to the level of requiring that out-of-state seller to have to collect their mid-sales tax. Bring it forward 10 years to the case in California with Borders Online and BordersOnline.com. We had a very similar fact pattern where you had books sold through the internet and you had the consumer able to go into a brick and mortar store and return that for a refund. Uh, 
California concluded that that did rise to the level of substantial nexus. You actually had some, you know, some differences between the different state Supreme Courts uh, on, on a very similar fact pattern. In each instance, the U United States Supreme Court has denied um, cert, and they have not taken another nexus case up for 25 years. And you know, Congress hasn't acted either. So you, know, you have different uh, circumstances and different fact patterns leading to different results in different states. Bring it forward another decade or so. Now you have this concept of click-through nexus, and this still applies agency nexus principles. For click-through nexus purposes, there's a presumption of nexus um, if an in-state person posts a link to an out-of-state retailer's website on its own website, and the in-state person receives a commission or other consideration for the sales facilitated for the activity. <clears throat> so this was click-through nexus was created. The concept was created in New York. Uh, they were sort of first, you know, first to adopt law that, that required online retailers that facilitated sales activities through, you know, web portal activity and commissions um, to require them to collect or remit sales tax. Obviously, well, not obviously, but I, mean, I assume many of you are familiar with Amazon and Overstock um, and their sales activities into New York and their relationships with third parties in New York that ended up facilitating sales on behalf of Amazon into New York even though Amazon didn't have its own physical connection there, it only had warehouses in Washington and some other states outside New York, the statute and the court in New York held, it held it held for the state, that that out-of-state retailer had to collect sales tax because of its relationship with the in-state, unrelated third-party you know, agent acting on, on its behalf. And it did so by you know, essentially adopting statutory guide, statutory law and, and, and certain requirements that had to be met but ultimately, uh, the New York Supreme Court—I'm sorry—the New York Court of Appeals upheld the decision of the lower courts, uh, and the, again, the Supreme Court denied cert. So now, many states, 19 to be exact, have adopted some variation of click-through nexus. So you'll see, in certain circumstances, if you go online yourself and try to buy from Amazon, depending on where you're located and depending on your state rules, Amazon may or may not have to collect sales tax from you, um, based on your—you know—even though they don't have a physical presence themselves there. And that could apply across any kind of business that has any kind of relationship with third parties and, and links to their websites uh, as it relates to their activities in a jurisdiction. So evaluating and understanding the, the contractual terms and, and whatnot with those you know, companies that are, that are engaged in that kind of activity um, is, is, a, is a vital piece of, of evaluating your overall nexus profile. Okay, then there's this concept of economic nexus. And economic nexus is traditionally an income tax concept. And the reason why I say that is the, the, the physical presence requirement of you know, having property or payroll or having an agent act on your behalf, that physical presence requirement was established in a case called Quill versus North Dakota back in 1992. And Quill basically was a, a, a retailer that I think was situated in Maine, and they sent catalogs into North Dakota and facilitated sales through the catalog sales. And that case was, was litigated through the, <clears throat> through the courts, all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the, and the court in Quill established this bright line physical presence test for sales tax purposes. It was not a case related to income taxes. So, from a from a sort of a precedential standpoint, or from a precedent standpoint, you have a Supreme Court holding that's 25 years old that says you have to have physical presence, and that's why they've been equating sort of this physical presence to property, payroll, and then the use of agents, um, and all the way through this you know this click through concept. There was another case, there's some other cases around, you know, the, for income tax purposes and using trademarks and, and having uh, this concept of economic nexus, that is generating a sufficient amount of receipts from customers in a state that would bring a, an out-of-state uh, company into a state without physical presence merely through sort of the existence of, of, of generating sufficient um, receipts or income uh, from customers in the state. The Jeffrey case was... Uh, the Toys R Us case in South Carolina, where you had and it, you know, Toys R Us set up an intangible holding company uh, in one entity, and then in another entity operated its brick and mortar stores in South Carolina, and the trademarks were put in, into the intangible holding company, and there was a royalty charge between the entities. And because South Carolina was a separate company state, um, it was essentially reducing the, the you know the brick and mortar store entity uh, income down to zero. Uh, or putting them into a loss position, and all the income that was being generated from its South Carolina activities was was essentially sucked out and, and, and put into the intangible holding company. They just didn't have an obligation to file a return there. South Carolina said, no, no, no. 
the fact that the intangible holding company is generating receipts from customers in South Carolina creates an economic presence or an economic nexus to South Carolina, and therefore that company had to file an income tax return and file income tax uh, and pay income tax to the state. That concept, though, uh, until recently has not been applied for sales tax purposes. And again, it goes back to the 25 years ago, Quill said you had to have physical presence. Moving that concept sort of along here, and it's been the context of time, many states have adopted what's called a, a, um, a factor presence test where you merely have de minimis amounts of property or payroll or a certain percentage of your property payroll, that's sufficient to create nexus, sort of establishing that de minimis sort of threshold. But also, much more importantly, is this sales threshold. If you generate more than $500,000 of sales in states that have adopted a factor presence test, for income tax purposes, most of these laws are written for, you have an obligation to file tax returns and pay applicable taxes to the extent your activities exceed the public by 86272 protections. So I raise these income tax sort of concepts around economic nexus because it's going to bleed into the next slide because states are evolving and they're pushing the envelope quite significantly uh, to apply these types of concepts to sales tax. Here's a specific example. Uh, Alabama uh, essentially says if you, may, if you generate more than $250,000 of sales from customers in Alabama and you conduct any of these other three activities that's outlined here, um, you by definition meet the definition of doing business in Alabama you have nexus to Alabama, and you have an obligation to collect their sales tax. So look at this, if you just distribute catalogs into the state where you otherwise advertise in Alabama that facilitate sales activities into the state that exceed the $250,000 threshold, for Alabama purposes, they are suggesting and they're saying that you have to collect their sales tax on those sales even without any kind of physical presence in the state. Uh, again, these, these laws are, are relatively new um, and they're pushing the envelope against that sort of like quill physical presence test. Economic nexus bills have been introduced in at least 18 states. And some of these bills are intentionally written because, uh, and they're ripe for litigation because they're, even though there's, you know, because they don't require an element of physical presence as required by quill. Okay? So it's very important to kind of think about, okay, well, I've got, I've got all these rules out there that the Supreme Court set forth and that, you know, Congress kind of set forth a long time ago. Uh, and now states are sort of, you know, out on their own, uh, sort of superseding those rules and superseding those laws, which are they're anticipating will create uh, litigation, um, so that somehow it can continue to push forward what we're going to talk about in the next slide, with relates on, on, on a future slide as it relates to the activity within Congress in order to address some of these issues. But the states are pushing the envelope on, in many in many different ways and avenues in order to get companies to be compliant with their sales and use tax reporting obligations. So that again, they can go back to like you know where, how they generate and facilitate most of their revenue. Okay, so again, I see that this is contrary to Supreme Court precedent, but these are the, this is the rule of the law in Alabama and, and, and in certain many other states that are that are pushing the envelope. Okay, um, there are other states like Colorado that instead of requiring the vendor to collect or emit sales tax, uh, even without a physical presence, which again is contrary to the uh, precedent in Quill. Rather, they are adopting what's called notice and reporting requirements. Colorado uh, essentially adopted this law that says out-of-state out non-collecting retailers with more than $100,000 of sales into Colorado essentially has to collect data and information relating to the, to the customer base in Colorado and give that information to the state tax authorities so that the state tax authorities can then use that information to make sure that the proper amount of of sales slash use tax was in fact you know, remitted by the by the consumer. So here you can see the first element. The first thing is that you have to actually inform your customer that what you're selling to them is taxable, and that you know you're not collecting sales tax, and that they may have an obligation to remit use tax. Many companies and many you know individuals don't appreciate or understand the fact that you know use tax is due even if sales tax is not collected. Yeah. So so let me, let me give an example of this. So. So my wife this weekend, I live in New Jersey, and my wife this weekend was coming in New York to buy something. And she said to me, uh, uh, hey, hey, Ross, you, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have them ship it home to us so they don't charge us sales tax. And I said, well, the problem with that is we still have to pay the use tax in New Jersey. Sa sales tax is a withholding mechanism to get a customer to pay the use tax. And so what Colorado has done is, is, is really clever. What they've said is, 
we can't force you to withhold sales tax unless you have the appropriate physical presence. But what we can do is require you to tell us who bought products so that we can go and assess them for use tax if they don't pay it. And you have an affirmative obligation, Colorado, even though you don't have any physical presence, even though you don't meet any of the nexus standards, you still have an obligation in Colorado to, to file a return and report. And that's the mechanism that they use to go out and chase people for the underlying use tax. This is unique to Colorado right now, but again, as Darren's been saying, states are, states are pushing on this stuff because it's such a big piece of their revenue. And as we all know, right, people from New Jersey go to New York, ship stuff home, and don't pay the use tax all the time. And so this is the mechanism that states are now, you know, quite cleverly using to catch those people. And if you're, if you're you know, in business in Colorado, if you're selling stuff in Colorado, you have this affirmative obligation. Right. Now, a company called Direct Marketing Association um, litigated the issue, thought that it was unconstitutional and beyond the bounds of what the state could do. But again, like uh, has become very customary, the United States Supreme Court has denied cert on this case, uh, and it is the, the law of the land as of now in Colorado. And there are uh, bills that are that have been passed or are pending in at least three other states, and I bet uh, you know there's probably a couple more at this point. Okay, so you know that that's a, there's a lot of sort of you know activity in and among the states, and you know this confusion around you know what the court decisions mean, and the states are pushing the envelope and. You know who's doing what, and really, you know, ultimately, you know, what does this come back to? It come back. It comes back to Congress's responsibility and obligation to regulate interstate commerce in and among the jurisdictions. And this sales tax issue has been a hot button issue for many, many years. And you know, as you can imagine, I mean, I'm sure yourselves are thinking about your own business. You know, it could be an enormous burden on a company to make sure that they're on top of you know, collecting and remitting sales tax, understanding the nexus profile and, and all of the things that go along with it. So Congress is trying, trying to create some, some uniformity by introducing some, some law, some bills into, into, uh, into the process that have, uh, that, you know, have, have gone so far in 2000, well, they've been introduced almost every single year, but in 2013 and 15, it actually passed through the Senate. And it was up uh, against the House and it, it didn't pass. And really what you have is you have, you know, really the brick and mortar stores are really pushing for what's called this Marketplace Fairness Act, right? They want to create this, you know, an equal playing field between themselves and the online retailers, right? I mean, to Russ's point, it's not unusual where, you know, you go into Best Buy and you see this wall of televisions and you're, you know, you pick the television that's right for you and then you go online, you find it for 50 bucks cheaper and they're not going to charge the sales tax, well, then you buy it from the online retailer. So this legislation, this Marketplace Fairness Act has been pushed by the brick and mortar store lobbying, you know, activity for, for quite, a, quite a while. It just hasn't, haven't gotten to the point where it's actually been able to uh, you know, pass through Congress. There's also another um, uh, act that's referred to the Online Sales Simplification Act. I think this has not a whole lot of uh, 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 not a whole lot behind it because it, I think it, it ultimately it requires you know the, 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 the states to sign on uh, as as participating states, and it applies taxability determinations in the in the origination state to the destination state, and then you apply the, the destination state's tax rate. It's a little bit of a convoluted sort of way of getting companies to comply. Um, and you know, it's been introduced, but it hasn't. It certainly hasn't gone uh, very far. It's sort of a, a an alternative to the Marketplace Fairness Act that hasn't had you know, hasn't, hasn't been able to make its way through Congress. So you know, I say this is congressional inaction. I mean, there's some activity going on within Congress, but nothing to the point where you know we're close to having an answer to what you know to simplify any of the sales and use tax reporting obligations as it relates to you know, interstate activities. Okay, so we, had, you know, we talked about the concept of nexus, the notice and reporting requirements, what's going on in Congress, and ultimately what that boils down to is that it's, it's, you know, it, it is your responsibility, the responsibility of the taxpayer to understand what your activities are in the jurisdictions in which you're generating and facilitating sales and do those activities create an obligation on you to collect or emit sales tax to the extent you are selling anything into the state that's taxable? So the first hurdle is nexus, right? And you may, you know, the, the, the idea would be you'd conduct a nexus study and say, okay, you know, there's 50 states, 45 have sales tax. We're going to, you know, maybe we have nexus in 20 of those. Those are the 20 states where we have to then determine taxability. Okay, sort of a two-step analysis. 
So sales use tax generally, 45 states, D.C., and thousands of localities have sales and use tax, impose some form of sales and use tax, typically imposed on retail sales of tangible personal property, okay? Not imposed on, on, on real property, with the exception of maybe Florida, where rental receipts are something that's sales tax in Florida, and intangible property uh, is not subject to sales tax. Where the complexity comes in is in the enumerated services, um, and this is where it comes in, especially into play in, your, in many of your industries as it relates to software as a service. And you know what is what you do and how you offer your services and how you contract with your customers. Does it equate to a taxable transaction? And you have to think about you know each of the states in which you have nexus, and do they adopt provisions in their laws that essentially impose an obligation of collection and sales tax on your type of revenue? So I threw up here a couple of examples: information services. Right, uh, information services are the type that you know, needs to be personal in nature, as opposed to being something that, you know, I'm sorry, information services has to be. It's not personal in nature. If it's not personal in nature, it's taxable. If it's personal in nature, it's not taxable. You know, generally speaking, data processing services, and these can be very broad definitions as to what data processing services mean. And this is where many SaaS-based companies get caught up in sort of the web of data processing and what does it mean to be processing data and having access to you know third-party infrastructure and and software that's hosted in the cloud, and of course, you know, SaaS here uh, uh, as well. Um, some states actually impose tax on all services unless they're specifically excluded, but th that's a minority of states. Uh, Russ raised this earlier. So, use tax is a complement to sales tax, right? It's one or the other. It's not. It's not two. There's not. It's not like the vendor has to collect sales tax and the consumer pays the use tax. It is one or the other. So, if your customers are all self-assessing use tax, you know, because you're not collecting it, well. You know, there's no real liability there because the state, you know, got their money. You just have to sort of prove that out to the extent that the, you know, if the state ever came looking to you for, for additional um, additional sales tax. Uh, many states, I mean, I'm sorry, many companies, many taxpayers don't comply with their use tax remittance obligations. You know, Ross gave the example of, a, of an individual, but we see this you know, consistently among companies we look at that they just simply don't have the processes in place to capture instances where a vendor should have collected sales tax but didn't. And therefore, they find themselves in a situation where they have use tax um, liability uh, you know, instead, of, instead, of, you know, instead of a sales tax liability that we may impose on the vendor. So to Russ's point, the intention of those use tax notification and reporting requirements is exactly you know, tied into getting companies to be compliant with their use tax responsibilities. Home rule localities. Uh, in addition to states, like I mentioned, there's thousands of localities that have their own uh, sales taxes. It's just that most states administer the compliance associated with the home the, uh, with the local taxes at the state level. So the state will actually collect both the state tax and the local tax, and then you know just distribute that among the localities in which uh, you know impose the tax. But you should be well aware there are five states in particular that actually have that don't do it that way, and the localities themselves. Uh, administer their own sales and use tax compliance, ob compliance obligations. So if you're doing business in Colorado and you're in Denver and you're in Boulder and you're in other you know, smaller localities where you have, you know, you have your, uh, your sales reps or your agents traveling on your behalf, you may be creating Nexus not only in Colorado, but also you know, one of the hundred localities in Colorado that actually have their own uh, requirements to, to collect their mid-sales tax uh, on companies. Um, same thing with Louisiana parishes, and the Alabama localities, um, each of these jurisdictions, uh, you just got to be aware of that you have local reporting requirements as well. Okay, um, so enumerated services. We saw we talked about sales of TPP. That's that's you know fairly easy to, to, to identify and understand. Unless your customer qualifies for an exemption, you're selling goods into the state. You have nexus there, and the goods aren't exempt themselves. Then you have an obligation to collect sales tax. But understanding whether or not what you do from a service perspective. Whether, not, whether that subject the sales tax is a whole other animal. Um, I gave some examples here, but an example of, of what, what you know the definition of an information service in New York, and you can you can read it for yourself. But essentially, what it says is, you know, if you are in the business of providing and uh, you know distributing information to customers, and it's not personal to the customer, rather it's available to all you know whoever it is that wants to buy it, that information. That you're selling, regardless of the medium of you know the way you're transferring it, is taxable. Perfect example is is, is uh, the the Bloomberg information that all the you know the financial houses get in New York. 
right? Everybody has their Bloomberg terminals that you know sit in the or however they distribute the information at this point. But the information that comes through Bloomberg is available to everybody in the same format and in the same sort of uh, you know uh, uh, same data. The same data is available to everybody. That information that Bloomberg disseminates is taxable to the consumer, right? So Bloomberg has an obligation to collect a sales tax on that, uh, or if for some reason Bloomberg doesn't have nexus in the state because you know, they don't have a physical presence there, uh, then of course the consumer has an obligation to, to self-assess use tax. Yeah, and the, and the place where we're, where we're seeing this increasingly is in the world of big data. If you're in a if you're in a data collection business, and you know you, you could be a you could be as simple as a website, but the website is cre cre is collecting data of people that visit the website and then on selling that data for use to other companies, that selling of the data that you have collected from your website uh, is subject to sales tax. Yeah. That comes up all the time now, very common. Yep. Agreed. Now, it is obviously specific to the jurisdiction. I'll give you an example in New York, but there's, you know, there may be a dozen states that impose some variation of sales tax on information services. Uh, not all states, but some. Um, move along to like data processing type services. And this is where a lot of the SaaS based activity gets sort of caught up to the extent that, you know, state hasn't addressed it specifically. But in Ohio, for example, right, taxable sales include automatic data processing. And then they define data, automatic data processing to essentially include providing access to computer equipment for the purpose of, per, of processing data. Right, so it's fairly broad definition. Um, and you can see how the state would apply that to simply providing access to, to somebody with remotely um, you know, stored software, right? software that's hosted in the cloud. Same with Texas. Right? Texas taxable services include data processing services, and they would include data processing services to include you know, um, word processing, data entry, all the way down to you know, other computerized data and information storage or manipulation. Right? Very sort of, sort of you know, vague concepts around you know, accessing computer equipment, uh, you know, through, you know, some kind of, you know, uh, virtual or, or, or digital mechanism. Yeah, again, an, an example of where this came up in a transaction is we had a client that was buying, uh, well, essentially like a legal back office, right? There's a relatively, relatively big business now um, of providing, uh, say, assistance in discovery for legal. And, and that's really just, you know, searching through data, and finding keywords and then sending it back off to the lawyers to see whether that is relevant to the discovery. And it's it's not you know it's not value add it's commodity. It's you know you're searching for the word um, insider trading, and um, and and that's taxable in Texas. And it's the kind of thing where a lot of people look at it and they say, well you know how can that possibly be a sales tax item, right? I got people in Texas sitting there searching computers, and the answer is it falls into this category of data processing services, clearly subject to tax. That's right, and it, it, that's that's exactly right, Russ. And you know, think about it. Right? Texas is one of those states that doesn't that you know, imposes a lot of types of a lot of services find themselves to be taxable in Texas. And if you think back to that pie chart I showed earlier, you know where you know the majority of, of revenue for states comes from personal income tax. Texas doesn't have a personal income tax, so they get their revenue from other places. And one of them is the margin tax, which takes place of the corporate income tax. But another place is by the fact that they they tax a very large number of, of, of services, data processing services being one of them. But again, the way this rule and these laws are drafted, they're very broad, and they've been applied not only in the concept of the way Russ just alluded to, but also just simply accessing software that's hosted in the cloud. Okay, so you know these, these definitions mean something different by state, so, and you know, how you contract with your customers is very important to understand, and whether or not you know, that contractual relationship between you and the customer ends up being a taxable transaction in a particular jurisdiction that you have nexus in, right? Okay, uh, software as a service, right? Historically, you had, in order for sales tax to apply, thinking about, you know, going back when I just said, it applies to sales of TPP. Historically, software was, was, was found itself to be subject to sales tax if it was delivered on a CD-ROM, right? And your, and your customer kept the CD-ROM. Uh, they would consider, the state would say that was a retail sale of tangible personal property for consideration. And um, that was considered a taxable transaction. So what companies used to do is they'd send somebody in with the, with the CD-ROM, load all the software onto the computer, and then leave with the CD-ROM. And for a while, that was not taxable until states caught on to that. And all of a sudden, load and leave transactions were taxable. 
Then you started to deliver software electronically. And states would say, well, nothing tangible is occurring. So therefore, it's not, I mean, the, you know, the taxpayer would take the position that nothing, trans, nothing tangible was transferring. So the, the position was, well, it's not taxable. So states out of the broadly apply and redraft their regulations to capture electronically delivered software as well. And now we're in the position where, you know, we have software that's hosted in the cloud. There is no transfer of software. And the, the, the reality is, you know, the states can't keep up with the way, you know, uh, our, the way we conduct commerce and how quickly things change. So, you know, they, they apply old law, you know, to new concepts or the statute may, may read one way and the regulations end up sort of leading in a different direction. And it is, you have this sort of like this contrast and this, con this con internal conflict in states, you know, as well as, you know, uh, taxpayer interpretations of, of what their obligations are. Um, and again, some states will say, you know, instead of having something that's specific, which we're going to look at the next slide as to how they apply sales tax to a particular situation, they'll just simply throw, well, my broad definition of data processing captures that and therefore it's taxable. Okay. And then you still have some states like California that they still require something tangible to be transferred in order for there to be an imposition of sales tax. So anything that's delivered electronically or accessed in the cloud from a California you know, taxpayer or a California customer, that is not a taxable transaction. So you, obviously you could have a taxable transaction in Texas, taxable transaction in New York, and the same exact transaction not being taxable in you know, California and elsewhere. Okay. Some examples of, of how, you know, the administrative imposition of sales and use tax on SAS, you know, Massachusetts has, you know, uh, has some, some fairly good um, you know, descriptive ways in which they've identified the particular situations to be taxable. Uh, they talk about, you know, transfers of software, which includes, you know, licensed to pre-written software that's hosted in the cloud. You know, they may distinguish between upgrades or, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of system, regular systematic upgrades of the software and whether or not that's taxable. Uh, and the same thing for New York. But th th these, these examples are ways in which the states have, you know, seen transactions that are occurring in the marketplace, looked at the way they've, you know, their statutes are written, the regs are written, and then sort of recreated or changed the way that they approach it in order to you know, capture that, that revenue associated with that, you know, the way you've, you're conducting your activities. And the, so the reason why you know, I put these in here is to give you a flavor for you know what's happening in the, in the, in the, you know, from a state legislative standpoint, a state regulatory standpoint, an administrative standpoint, and how these things are changing all the time. And it's really incumbent upon the taxpayer to be well informed and understand what's going on, so they don't find themselves in a situation where they have this liability, like I had showed in that in that exposure, uh, that example exposure calculation. Okay. Okay. Um, this slide sort of depicts, you know, sort of like you know, the evolution of, of, you know, the software as a service. And, you know, we think about what it used to be on, you know, on-premise uh, activities where every company would have their own servers and their own, you know, networking and their own storage capabilities. And they'd, you know, get somebody to come in and, and you know, they'd buy them and they'd have it delivered on a CD-ROM or, you know, again, have somebody come in and load and leave it onto their, onto their equipment. Uh, and you'd have all this, you know, sort of one on-site on premise, uh, premises um, type activities. And then it's evolved. Right, where maybe you outsourced your infrastructure to a third party, but you still maintained all your applications and your data and everything, all your operating systems on your own. And then it's evolved, right, where you've outsourced more of that. And then it's evolved again to where we're on software as a service. And each, you know, there's probably, you know, people on this phone that are, in, that are operating their activities in one variation of this sort of evolution of, of, of you know, on-premise software all the way through cloud computing that needs to be considered as it relates to the particular jurisdictions that you have Nexus in, and how the states impose or whether they would impose a sales tax collection and written obligation on the way in which you conduct your operations. Right? That's, what, that's what this slide is intended to depict, sort of the evolution of how we've gone. And then this is you know, the map as it stood at least in October of 2016. Um, you, know, you can see where you know, it's really all over the board in terms of you know, the taxability of SaaS, of, I'm sorry, of SaaS based solutions of, you know, hosted activities, you know, and, and whether or not the states are, you know, likely taxable or, or, or likely not tax, uh, taxable, uh, it really depends upon the jurisdiction and how you conduct your operations. And it's essential to making sure that you're on top of this uh, in order to, um, you know, be compliant. Okay. Almost at the end, takeaways, right? So the suggestion is get a hold of your, you know, your, your, your Nexus profile, understand what you do 
uh, in the jurisdictions in which your customers are based, uh, and you know probably most importantly where you haven't been uh, you know thought or or, or or haven't been a compliant taxpayer, right? Either have somebody within your company, uh, if to the extent they're qualified, um, think about these issues, or you know work with a state tax advisor to make sure that you're on top of you know your particular business operations and whether or not your activities uh, require you or um, trigger or, or uh, create nexus for you in the states in which you've operated. Document the basis of your conclusions. Right? Too many times I get into a situation on a, on, a, on a call where I've got 20 minutes to talk about operations at a business, and you know they talk to me about how they go about selling and how they go about training and how they go about installing and all the different things. Uh, but then they say, well, but we don't really do that, you know, in any you know, sort of substantive way, and we think our activities are de minimis. If that's true, then document it. Put it in, put it in some kind of a document that that, that gives you know a reader you know, some semblance as to you know how you reached your conclusions. Um, so have a, essentially conduct or perform a nexus study. Once you've determined nexus in your nexus states, determine taxability of your revenue streams. All right? Again, it's going to require an in-depth analysis of reading contracts, understanding the way you invoice your customers, um, and figuring out whether or not what you sell, whether it's taxable or not in your next estate. In, the way you invoice your customer matters, right? If you, have, if you sell both product and services, right, the product may be taxable, but maybe the service is not. But if you're invoicing your customer, you know, a bundled transaction, right, something that's, you know, a charge for both the product and the service, well, you just made the entire transaction taxable. Right? Because the state can't bifurcate out what's taxable and not taxable. They're just going to look at it and say, well, something's taxable here, so we're just going to assume it's all taxable. So invoicing your customers and the way you invoice your customers matters uh, after you've determined your nexus and, how you, and, and obviously your you know, taxability of your revenue streams. So you get your nexus study, you get your taxability study, and then you, you know, obviously you, you implement that. You may find that you have exposures. Right? You may find that you have you know, issues where, you know, um, you, know, you it's, it's material enough to, to create a, a liability that you know, should be dealt with. Uh, there are um, uh, mitigation strategies that can be deployed or implemented. Uh, many states have what's called the voluntary disclosure agreement. Right? Many states states are fully aware that, that taxpayers and companies, they don't have an appreciation or don't really know that they have these obligations. So they do offer these programs called voluntary disclosure programs, and, and oftentimes you can enter into an agreement with the state anonymously uh, to reduce the amount of liability that you would have to pay because what the state really wants is you to become compliant prospectively. So that worst case scenario example, that assumes the state catches you before you come forward voluntarily. Right? Yeah, this is this is a really important point. So be, if if you haven't been filing returns, then your statute of limitations, you know, goes on essentially forever. Mm -hmm. What the voluntary disclosure lets you do is reduce that statute of limitations substantially, get compliant, and not have a problem prospectively. That's right. Yeah, and it, you know the the programs will differ by state. The benefits have a little bit different you know, differences by state, but typically what the benefit is is it will limit the look back period that a state will look back, really tied to the applicable statute of limitations, right? So to Russ's point, if you never file a tax return, the statute of limitations doesn't apply, and the state can go back indefinitely. Yeah. But if you come forward and you voluntarily disclose your activities in the state, they will cut it off. And it's typically the cutoff is typically tied to the applicable statute of limitations being 36 or 48 months, depending on the jurisdiction. They will also waive the penalty, right? And as you go back to that exposure example, the penalty can be quite substantial, oftentimes, you know, 25% of the total liability. So they'll waive that penalty. Uh, most jurisdictions won't waive interest because it's statutorily, you know, imposed. But there are some states that actually do waive the interest component as well. So this, and, and, what, and what the state agrees to is they won't go back any further than the look back period. But the taxpayer has to has to agree to becoming a compliant taxpayer prospectively. So VDA, yeah. VDAs are important are uh, you know for important sort of mitigation strategies to be aware of. And look, there's 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 a couple of important ways that this all comes up. Um, it can come up during your financial audit, where for for whatever reason the firm that's doing your financial audit realizes that you have some exposure, comes to you and says, look, we think you have some exposure on on sales tax and we want to create a reserve. Then they look at what the reserve is and they go, oh my God, you haven't done voluntary disclosures. The reserve is a huge number because it goes back forever. And now you have, you know, have, have a really you know, uncomfortable discussion with your, with your auditors to try to figure out how you can reduce that reserve. 
Um, it can come up if you if you have an IPO, because that's just going to come up in sort of normal uh, IPO diligence. And it can come up if you get audited, which again creates the sort of you know really bad scenario where you haven't done your VDA, now you get audited, and and the look back period goes back essentially forever. Um, and then as we've been talking about, it can come up during a sale process where you're subject to diligence. You know, every diligence request list has questions around sales tax. Um, and again, if if you're not compliant and you haven't done the VDAs, then you have this large potential exposure because it's gone on, you know, because the, the, the statute of limitations goes on forever. Right. Yeah, and, and you know, again, the, and the buy side advisor, and I've been in that, you know, those shoes many times, yeah, I don't have access to all of the information that you would need to actually perform a proper nexus analysis. I don't have the time, to be honest with you, to, to do a proper taxability study. So what happens is, is I just back into like, okay, well, what's my, what's the potential risk here? And the potential risk is nexus everywhere and then, you know, taxable presumably everywhere. And that's not, that's not the position you want to be in. You re, you'd much rather go into that discussion at that point where, like, I've, I've done my, my study, I've done my nexus study, here it is. I've done my taxability study, here it is. Yes, I may have some exposure. We haven't cured all the issues as it relates to you know these mitigation strategies, um, but it's not a, it's not a fifty million dollar issue. You know, it's a five hundred thousand dollar issue. Something to that you know prospect. So going into that process with the, with the, you know, sort of having done some of that work ahead of time, you know, it, it, honestly, it makes a lot of sense. And then of course you know compliance, right? You know, you're gonna do it if you are you gonna comply. We often find you know companies comply with just some some internal folks. Uh, but sometimes there's, there's opportunity to outsource it depending on how, you know, how, how significant the compliance burden is. Uh, and there's technology solutions that, that are available in the marketplace, um, you know, whether you require monthly reporting annual or, or, or uh, you know, quarterly. Uh, you know, and it, it goes back to, you know, there's 45 states, D.C., hundreds of, you know, hundreds of localities that are home rule localities, and then thousands of localities generally. It can be a fairly significant compliance burden, but there, there are solutions out there that make it easier. And that was it. So I'm happy to take any questions. If anybody has any questions, I know we all we ran right up to the hour, um, but I'm certainly happy to take any questions uh, right now. I, I haven't seen any come in, um, but if you'd like to ask a question, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Some, I'm happy to answer it. No questions, Aaron. You've made everything 100% crystal clear. It seems like. All right. Well, my, so, uh, my my again my my, inform my contact information is there, and I'm, I'm happy to take any phone calls from anybody. If you have any you know general questions, I'm, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. So so thanks everyone for participation. Again, we're uh, we're happy to field any questions or phone calls you have. Also encourage you to call you know whoever's providing your tax advice now. This is uh you know this is this is sort of an area that 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 frankly you know all all the big accounting firms are, are perfectly capable of helping on. Um you know you so uh, you know reach out to your 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 tax advisors or reach out to us and we're happy to help in any way we can. Okay, thank you everybody from KPMG. All right, thanks Mark. Okay, bye everybody.